Hello, I'm John. Welcome to Edgetone Studios. Today in the studio, I'm going to fulfill the request of a fellow YouTuber. So Martin over at Myers Street Records, uh, check his link below uh, for his YouTube channel. He's been watching my Musicians of Vancouver Island series and he thought the um, mixes I did for the bands were sounding pretty good. Uh, so he suggested it'd be interesting to see um, my mix process. So I thought that's what I'd do today. So the first uh, band I brought in was Carmine and um, they had a song called Mariana, which is the first one that's played on that um, episode. And the cool little thing about Mariana is that Reagan, the singer, was going to join our Deadlands role-playing game. So Deadlands is a horror Wild West steampunk role-playing setting um, that is uh, put out by Pinnacle Entertainment Group and is uh, using the Savage World system for you role players out there. And um, Savage World is one of my favorite uh, systems for playing role playing games. And uh, anyway, she was going to join our, our Deadlands game. Uh, it didn't work out, but because she had so much uh, sort of cowboy lingo in her head from researching the uh, system, um, this song, Mariana, was born in one of their writing sessions and is about a fellow who's been shot down in a duel and the pro protagonist or antagonist, I guess, is singing to the daughter, Mariana, about why they had to kill her father. Anyway, so let me switch over to my Studio One session. So um, this is this is my session for that song. So we recorded um, multiple takes, and then I've just pulled out the take that we used, uh, the final take we used for uh, the video. And the way I lay out my sessions is very typical to old school analog consoles, which is uh, drums first, uh, followed by bass. Normally I would have this uh, bass color coded in blue and keys, and normally I'd have my vocals color coded in yellow, but for some reason I did um, a teal green instead. Um, and if there was a guitar, I would have guitar after bass and then keys and then vocals. So my vocals are always on one side, drums on the other side. And one of the things I'm using in Studio One, and it's one of the reasons I like Studio One, is this feature called Mix Effects. So Mix Effects are different than a plugin. This is not a VST you can add to your other um, DAWs. This is specific to Studio One. And mix, this, the Mix Effects are basically emulating or turning my mix here into an analog console. And the way they do that is that every single track here, you can see these little... Um, LEDs showing uh, the mix effects are being applied there, uh, that as the uh, audio plays back, it emulates the drive and the noise and the crosstalk of an analog console. And there are multiple consoles. In this case, I used a tube console because I thought it brought out the vibe of the song a little bit better. Um, it's a very subtle difference and it's the type of thing you should do. You can apply it after you've done a mix and see what it sounds like and it can be kind of cool, but you literally have to remix because you might get a lot, bunch more lows coming into a bunch of tracks. The crosstalk could cause certain tracks to be louder than others. So ideally you mix uh, into the mix effect. So that's on um, the whole time. And if we listen to the song here, this is the, um, the final mix, uh, just to give you a sense of it. <laughs> Take it right to the chorus here. Okay, so I won't go through the whole song. This is a rare case where I'll be using headphones on video because I realized that while well, trying to record this the first time that what I'm listening through my through my speakers is being picked up by the microphone and being added to OBS and potentially coloring what you're going to hear as my mix. So, um, so if if we go to how I start a mix, uh, basically there wouldn't be any effects on, so I'll just turn them all off, and I would start with the drums and I would literally just dial up levels just to get it sounding reasonably good between the various components. Now, 
I'm not going to muck with this mix, mix very much because I want it to come back to the mix it is. And so if I start playing with the levels here as I might have while I was mixing, uh, I would be readjusting them after I added compression, EQ, etc. And then I would typically start with the kick and bring my effects on. And what I tend to use is uh, Studio One and the Studio Live Mixers has a plugin called Fat Channel, which is basically a, a high pass filter, a gate, a compressor, and an EQ. And each of these can be swapped out for the particular type of compressor, or particular type of EQ you want to use. I tend to keep my default to 1176 and the default EQ to the vintage EQ and then swap them as I go. But typically I use the pro EQ as my EQ and just use the fat channel for the compressor emulation. So there's an emulation of SSL, a FET compressor, an LA-2A, a variety of other compressors. And I'll show you the vocal one I use later. So um, if we come to just the drums here, so here now you can hear the compression I've got going on on the kick and I kind of severely cut the lows on this kick. I took out all, everything below 40 hertz, basically, or started at 40 hertz, and pumped up here for the little hit on the, the thud of the kick. It's given a bit of the beater sound. Um, with the snare, turn those on. Similar thing, 1176 dialed it into just moderate compression and then the pro eq i just boosted a little bit of the uh, 1k ish range just to get a bit more snap and if we actually soloed any one of these there's the kick by itself kick and snare sound great but you really have to bring the overheads in when you're mixing drums because whatever's going on in the overheads is going to color and add volume to the other parts of the drums so what i typically do is cut the lows on the overhead i noticed on this mix i didn't uh, i literally just put the compressor on and bring up the high frequency shelf which i think is around 12k on this compressor it might be more like 10 um, and then 7.2 just to give that shimmer so without whoops without the overheads and once you start bringing all the drums in and turning all the effects back on you get a sense of the drum sound I was going for and for each of these tracks I'll also turn back on the, the reverb because I've got a drum reverb going on for the whole kit, but I'm adjusting the parts of the drum reverb. That's not a reverb here. Uh, for the snare, the tom hat, the toms and the overhead have a reverb, no reverb on the kick. Cause it will be, the reverb going around the drums will muddy or, or, or add a feel to the kick without it needing to have that low end, low frequency um, reverb. So let me turn the reverb on now. And So that's the reverb without EQ. So I use the re room reverb, 45 milliseconds, just a short reverb. And there's the beginning of the end of the song again. And for the EQ on the reverb, I just cut the highs and the lows. And then lastly, on the drums, I would put a bus over the whole drum kit. And I use this Brit compressor, which is basically an SSL style compressor. And I find that just fattens up the whole sound drastically. Like those toms. Okay, the bass was uh, recorded direct. Um, uh, so Brianna had her own pedal board with a direct out on it. So we just took that through. I think I just brought that through one of the SSL uh, six channel uh, channel strips into my Personas mixer and you get a sense of the fuzz bass of it. Uh, you're just hearing the reverb there. So for effects, again, fat channel for a compressor, this time the classic compressor. It's just the Studio One's built-in compressor. I'm not sure what it's emulating. And then Pro EQ, boosting some lows, taking out the sub frequencies and giving a bit more brightness into the bass so that once it's mixed in with the keys, it's still cutting through. 
Um, the other thing I'm doing here is I'm sending a side chain from the kick drum. So the kick drum has side chain set up and then you see that it's the kick is on send and the drum or bass um, is has the insert coming in as a side chain into the fat channel. Uh, so you see a side chain here and it's got the kick coming in as a send. Uh, I think we just saw that twice if I go over here. Sorry, there's the, uh, oh, just when I click here, it opens up the base. But basically, it's a side chain send. So the amount of kick coming in is ducking the kick when, ducking the base whenever the uh, kick drum hits. So uh, here's the difference with, let's get them both playing together. There's the base originally in the kick. And that's with the side chain. It's subtle but it helps the kick punch through the bass. Uh, I've got everything going on here again. Okay, what else? Keys, so Rowan was playing uh, Korg uh, Stage Vintage, uh, the second version, um, as well as a Nord lead, I believe. It was one of the Nords. And he played that through uh, Guitar Cabinet, and that was this channel. And of course, what do you hear most of the time? The drums bleeding through because even though we had this at the front of the room facing towards the drum kit, it was picking up the drums. So the drums are being added to from the keys. So now you take the drums into effect with the keys added in. It actually subtly changes the, sorry, I'll just do this the brightness of the drum kit. So as I was mixing and bringing on all the elements, I would keep adjusting the EQs and that on the drum kit to match with what was going on for the whole mix. Uh, the rest of the keys were um, background tracks that um, the band had provided. And so these are mixed uh, after the fact. So such, such as this one here. And basically on the keys, it was, uh, EQ on each of them. I'll show you the types of things I was doing. So a little bit of brightness, pulling out some high high mids or low highs, boosting the mid range for the main keys. This one's not even playing at this time, but you know, again, boosting boosting some mids to bring it into the mix a little bit better. Uh, make sure, and then these are all going to the uh, main reverb for the whole band. Okay, vocals, uh, Reagan was the primary singer and she is singing through my Shure Super 55, which is the absolute worst choice for trying to have isolation in a small room, but we chose it because it looked cool on the video. Uh, so when you hear the uh, playback of the um, vocal channel, what do you hear? Drums, <laughs> primarily. And then you get the vocals. And as soon as you bring compression in, which of course I did. It brings up even more of the drums. So what I do for vocal compressors, this is my typical vocal chain. Uh, it's not always this compressor, but I've started to use this fairly consistently, uh, the Everest tube leveling compressor. I'll set a fast attack to catch the initial transients and just do a subtle amount of compression, like not even 2 dB, and then pump that into uh, the same compressor, but set to a slow attack or a medium, uh, medium attack, medium release in this case, or a slow attack, slow release on some vocalists. And then when you turn the EQ on here, I brought out a bit of presence and I also use dynamic EQ here. You'll see that occasionally my uh, playback stopped for some reason. Oh, it's uh, because it's only that's the only the uh, verse vocals. It just subtly brings down some of the mid-range frequencies that I found were uh, being problematic in the whole mix. And if we look at the, um, let's see, the chorus vocals here, which basically I just separated onto a separate track so I could process them separately if I wanted to. Um, let's solo those. So damn quick, You'll see that 
Obviously, it drives the compressor a bit harder because she's singing louder and a very similar EQ. I just wanted to be able to control the volume separately. Okay, the next uh, thing I kind of ran into, so there are some background vocals, which are uh, both uh, Brianna singing along as well as provided background vocals. Uh, so let's just turn all those on for... And if I turn all these inserts back on. So let's go to the second chorus here. So I've got those uh, background vocal tracks uh, quite subtle. I didn't want them to be too prominent because um, it's a live recording. And if it sounded like there was six and more people in the room, it would look kind of weird. So I kept them fairly subtle in the background. Uh, let me turn on my reverb and delay here. Okay, so as I start bringing in the reverbs for the vocals, let's bring that up. Somebody shot him down. Mariana, all the blame's on me. Tell your mama, all the blame's on me. Had to go, but you'll move on quickly. So one thing you'll notice is with all that drum bleed, I had to be very subtle in vocal delay because as I bring up the vocal delay, the snare hits especially, you hear the delay going on. So I'll give you an example just by... Somebody, somebody, somebody shot him down. So you can't put a ton of delay on a live track that has all that drum bleed on it. Actually, let me just put it back to where it was here. So... You know, typically, typically for the vocals, like I, sh I showed you, I use a dynamic EQ to tame some of the mids. Uh, then for the background vocals, it was just boosting frequencies that tended to work for that particular vocal track. And it was a little bit different for each. And I thinned out these ones just because I think that's the really high frequency um, background vocals. And I think there was some bleed on those tracks, if I recall, was why I did that. Okay, so once once that mix is all going there, That's basically, that's basically the sound of my final mix before post-processing. So I'm really used to not mixing live off the floor type situations, but mixing, oh, we're also missing the reverb on the keys, but mixing um, studio recordings where we've isolated parts so that the vocals will not have a drum bleed, etc. So it was interesting trying to find the balance between EQing things to make them brighter, but not adding too much more brightness for the drums. Um, and once I had the reverb uh, to the keys, found that it basically helped them bring them to sound like they're in the same room. So the drums have their own reverb that's a short, quite uh, quick reverb. The room reverb for everybody else is like 1.4 seconds, equal mix between uh, the reverb and the pre-delay. Um, the pre-delay is set reasonably normal, so it's basically sounding like a, a hall to some extent. And lastly, uh, I put everything on the mix bus through the newfangled audio elevate. Uh, my buddy Ian told me about the uh, newfangled audios plugins. There, I, I have very few plugins that aren't stock Personas plugins, and that was not because there aren't great plugins out there, and I don't want them. It's because I wanted to make sure I learned the tools that came with my product well. And I found in the past when I used to own lots of plugins, I would just constantly try new things and never get good at a particular tool. So I want to be better at certain tools. Um, but this has definitely become my go-to um, limiter at the end of my chain. So just, just so you hear the difference, this is basically um, a limiter, uh, um, a transient uh, shaper, a drive shaper, and it has multiple sections to it. So these are the main parameters. Then there's like a filter bank where you define which sections are, have what filters, how many filter banks you have. Um, when it's limiting, you can adjust. It's like a multiband limiter. So you can limit different frequencies more or less than others or and boost them more or less than others. 
Uh, and then a transient shaper, again, primarily 100%, but at low frequencies are being adjusted separately. And then a clipper. And so if you hear this kicking in and out, of course, it'll probably get louder because it's a limiter coming in, but let's listen to the track. Listen to the kick, especially. So I basically chose this. I went through a few of the sample uh, presets and then adjusted the gain and the transient emphasis to taste based on how that sounded. But it sounded pretty good as that. Can you play me a song called Pay Me What You Want Me? Can I tell you a story? So there's the multiband filter. You can see um, the see the limiting per band going. So even though it's quite aggressive sounding in terms of how much punch it's added to the mix, it's the you can see the limiting is very subtle. Like it's, it's just touching the limiter uh, on peaks. And then finally, I throw the whole thing through a, a, a brick wall limiter just to um, basically set to. Uh, in this case, extreme gain. So I've just got a, a 0.1 dB minus 0.1 dB ceiling thresholds all the way up, so that it's not clip, you know, not grabbing it too much. And then I boosted the gain into that. Just, again, just to get a subtle reduction and make sure that I'm never peaking past true peak for export. And then that's what I exported and brought into the video for the actual. Uh, video recording itself so so that's it that's basically uh, my template um, or, or the way I work through it uh, you'll probably find if I do another one um, you probably find the other two bands I did were very similar um, uh, similar multi multi piece groups with uh, the other one uh, two guitars bass uh, two vocalists etc so similar sort of process uh, different drum kit um, tip typically the same mics in each scenario the only thing I didn't mention is um, uh, the mic that I used for the background vocals which was uh, Brianna's vocals um, was the Blue Encore 200, which is just a dynamic mic, but it's a powered dynamic mic. And I really like it for vocals, especially live vocals, uh, because it gives a bit more of the drive of a condenser mic, but also uh, acts like a dynamic mic for live live performance, which is great. And then for the keyboard amp and what I typically put on a guitar amp, and that's what the keyboard amp was, the guitar amp, is um, a large diaphragm condenser. I don't use like a 57, uh, although I have, sometimes I do. Uh, typically those are relegated to my drum kit, so I'll use a large diaphragm condenser, in this case the uh, Bees Knees microphones, um, uh, Oliver, which is their U47 clone in their studio series. So it's about uh, Canadian. It's about a thousand dollar microphone. So it's uh, reasonably well priced for a high, high quality uh, microphone. And I've used that on studio vocals quite a bit. That's normally what I'd use if I wasn't doing live in the room. So hopefully that was interesting. Uh, thanks, Martin, for the suggestion. It gave me some good new YouTube content. And um, I'll try and do another one of these for the next band. Take care, everyone. See you soon.